All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Future of New York conversation. My name is Travis Terry. I am the uh, president of Capolino, which city's large, but we like think is the city's largest urban strategy firm, where we help uh, organizations, big, medium, and small, succeed in New York through our combination of lobbying strategy and transactional services. And I have the honor of moderating today's discussion with a uh, good friend and fellow soccer fan. I should note, we were just chatting earlier. Andrew Kimball, the uh, president and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, as you may know, the purpose of these uh, Future of New York webinars is to invite civic leaders in a discussion with our experts around how they see New York evolving, as well as providing important insights that can help you make informed decisions, better informed decisions, to help your business or organization thrive. In the last year and a half, we've done about 15 of these covered topics like urban planning, tourism, procurement, the United Kingdom, United States connection, green building, technology, politics, hospitality, cannabis, and my home borough of the great borough of Queens. Um, all of these events uh, have uh, some fascinating insights. And uh, if you'd like to read uh, or watch some of the old ones, they can all be found on our website, capolino.com. Uh, today's discussion is a very important one. I know that this is on the top of everybody's minds. Um, and the truth is that the New York City economy, which I should note, I was checking, uh, Andrew, your website beforehand. Uh, the New York City economy has a gross municipal product of $1.66 trillion, which is larger than the entire state of Texas. Let's take that, Greg Abbott. Um, and larger than all but 10 countries in the world. But our economy is certainly evolving at a rapid pace. Everything we know is being modernized, thanks in part to technological innovation and the impact of the COVID pandemic. Buildings are becoming smarter and greener. It's an environmental term, not a color term. Um, the economic core of New York City is slowly being decentralized from Manhattan. Global and national competition for talent is at an all-time high. And as noted before, technology is innovating everything we do from the way we communicate to the way we receive healthcare and education. I do wanna say that I'm very encouraged by a number of the ideas and policies, and especially I should say the team um, that has been uh, organized by Mayor Adams and Governor Kathy Hochul. Uh, just in the past couple months and year, we've seen not only just great coordination between the city and state, but historic investment in our infrastructure, mobility, and housing. In fact, tomorrow uh, we'll have our first Long Island Railroad trains run into Grand Central Station after, I don't know, decades and decades of planning and construction. We've seen real connections on modernizing our education system to prepare young people for economic success through focuses on issues like dyslexia and technical skills. Then there's, perhaps most importantly, there is a real openness to the value of business and how business and public private partnership can help enable economic success. Perfect example was an announcement yesterday that the mayor made with Goldman Sachs and MasterCard on a $75 million opportunity fund for cheap small business financing. Um, many of the ideas and the details around a lot of this vision can be found in the governor and mayor's shared economic vision called the New New York, called New New York, which was announced late 2022 at an Abney breakfast. Uh, we also saw details of the economic vision laid out in the governor's recent state of the state. And I imagine, uh, Andrew, that there will be some, some additional details announced this Thursday at the mayor's state of the city. Looking forward to that. Um, but thankfully, as I mentioned before, we have a great economic development team, and, and that's a really encouraging thing. Um, and in fact, there's no more brilliant mind on this to me than Andrew, because it's not just about vision, it's really about implementation and, and gaining success. Um, and Andrew has been at the top, at the forefront of that for many, many years. Um, he was appointed uh, just by way of background, where was appointed by Mayor Adams as president and CEO of EDC on February 23rd, 2022. Prior to that, he was CEO of Industry City, creating this incredible experience where he led over $450 million in infrastructure and placemaking initiatives that grew jobs from 1,900 to 9,000. It's a 374% increase, in case you're counting. Increased the number of businesses from 150 to 600. That's a 300% increase. So Andrew, if you could pull that off while you're at the city, that would be pretty remarkable stuff and quite a legacy. Uh, he's also overseen transformation of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and had stints at uh, the Olympic bid NYC 2012, New York Public Library, 
I also just want to point out that Andrew is one of the most civic and socially responsible human beings I've ever met, having sat on a number of boards, including chair, chairing Coro New York, uh, and always really setting up a, a positive example. So Andrew, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, just real quick before I start, just a quick housekeeping thing. Um, Andrew and I are going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, um, and then we'll turn it over to audience questions. If you do have questions, please place them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we will um, try to get to as many as we can. So, Andrew, thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, congratulations on all the great work you've done. And let me just start off with a basic question, which I think uh, will be helpful for our audience, which is, can you talk a little bit about EDC, its mission, its purpose, um, and how you define economic development and inclusive economic development, which I know is something that has been top of your mind for your whole career. Uh, thanks, Travis. Thanks for having me um, uh, for that generous introduction. I, I, the length probably has more to do with my age than <laughs> but um, uh, I've been a consumer of this series, so it's it's great to be on the other side answering the questions, and hopefully I, I stand up to your other interviewees. Um, yeah, what does EDC do? So EDC is the city's prime economic development engine. Um, we have a number of key elements uh, in our strategy. Um, one is something you mentioned before, which is being the major liaison to the private sector. Um, it's been a while, unfortunately, in New York that we had an administration that looked to lock arms with the private sector to celebrate the private sector's gains, to really promote New York City as a destination for companies both to ex expand that are here uh, or to move from elsewhere in the country. So the first sort of bu bucket is business development. Um, we stand up very well to our counterparts across the country, but we don't take anything for granted. So whether it's Boston or San Francisco and biotech or Dallas, Miami, um, we're competing very, very hard. Um, for many countries around the world, we're at the top in terms of for foreign direct investment, but again, we cannot take that for granted. So bucket number one is business development. I would say bucket number two is developing healthy um, commercial hubs across the city and every borough um, that are live work, um, that also have strong connections um, to local uh, schools, DOE schools and CUNY schools. Um, and workforce development programs um, to create nodes across the city of growth. Another uh, element of creating the commercial nodes is really the kind of uh, planning work that we do, and New New York is a big example of that, and I'm happy to talk about some of the outcomes of that studies. The, the third is the sectors that we focus on. So we tend to focus on high growth, high wage sectors that are, that are um, that are there for the taking. Mm -hmm. um, so those tend to be very tech adjacent, um, thinking green tech, clean tech. Um, there are all kinds of elements of what can be done from offshore wind to heat pump technology to local law 97 compliance. Uh, we see a real opportunity to drive the economy. Life sciences, uh, a lot of projects going on in the life sciences area. I'd be happy to talk about the more traditional tech sectors um, cyber, AI, machine learning, robotics, um, and then also um, uh, entertainment and media, a sector that is still very, very strong, um, film, television, gaming, um, and tourism around that. Although we're not the main driver of tourism in the city, we work very closely with our partners at NYC and company. Third bucket is um, infrastructure, both resiliency and transportation around that. Um, so people sometimes are surprised to hear we have a $9 billion capital budget um, and are one of the main players in resiliency projects across the city, particularly in lower Manhattan, also in the implementation of bike lanes that play a key role um, in economic development. And then freight distribution and mobility, absolutely critical to our future, particularly movement of freight on water. And when you see what's coming down the pike with the rehab of the BQE and congestion pricing, uh, the need to move goods around more smartly um, and by water um, is more important than ever. So that that's a little feel for everything that we do. We brought a real focus to um, equity and inclusion to our work. Uh, the mayor has highlighted it's not good enough just to come back to where we were in 2019. 
Um, but we've got to grow the economy and we've got to create better opportunities for for everyone in the city. Um, and that comes in a number of forms for us. It comes in re relentless focus on partnering with CUNY. CUNY is one of the great right. equalizers in society um, in the city, um, does more to move people into the middle class than all the Ivies and the six largest colleges after the Ivies combined. Um, so a key partner for us, DOE where we can, workforce development in each of the key sectors that I highlighted, and really a sector that's growing is around um, diverse BIPOC entrepreneurship. So in a number of different areas, whether it's venture capital um, or um, innovation sectors, we're very, very focused on, on entrepreneurship. That's great. That's great. You, you, I think people tend to forget just how much the city of New York and EDC is focusing on helping these all these economic areas just thrive and, and be successful and, and the, the details and effort that's put into it. So how is New York doing? I mean, can you just talk about the status of the economy, kind of how, you know, where do we compare to the rest of the world? Are we doing okay? Or are we starting to come back? What is your sort of take on all that? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I mean, 10th largest economy, metro area in the world. Um, so we are competing on a, uh, in a global marketplace. That also means we're buffeted by um, global trends, um, you know, whether it's inflation or recession happening elsewhere in the world or um, the Russian war on Ukraine. All of these things have an impact um, on New York. Um, you know, we don't have our heads in the sand. We, we lost a million jobs during COVID. Um, we were hit the hardest in terms of job loss. Um, but with all that said, there are a lot of, of positive signs. Um, so we've had 11 straight months of job growth. We've now gained back about 920,000 of a million jobs. So we're getting very, very close to um, where we were. Um, tourism is starting to come back. Hotel occupancy um, is up. I think once China opens up again and, and folks are feeling safe to travel, that's going to really give us a boost um, in terms of uh, tourism and accommodation. Um, the other interesting stat that I love to highlight is just how the entrepreneurial culture is so uh, strong in New York City. So you look at all the companies in New York City one in nine were created in the last 12 months. One in wow. nine in the last 12 months. Hmm. An astonishing statistic. And you see the majority of those, interestingly, and this goes to the question of New New York and planning and how we support uh, Midtown and Downtown, but uh, the vast majority of those small businesses created along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront um, but with a sprinkling in the Bronx and other boroughs. Um, you don't see as much uh, in Midtown and Lower Manhattan Hence, part of the challenge, part of how we need to think new, newly about uh, our commercial hubs. Fascinating. That's that's fascinating. One in nine companies. Let's go. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, just a quick. Could you comment a little bit on growth industries? I mean, you talked a little bit in your in your opening remarks, but where you really sort of see the you know with the job growth coming and as we topple the the one million mark, where 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 are some of those industries that are really starting to grow in New York? Well, a lot of making up that last 80,000 to get to where we were comes in um, in hotel accommodation tourism um, hmm. and restaurants as well. Um, so entertainment, that's that's where really where, you know, we have been growing jobs steadily back, but we're still not back to where we were. Um, but where you see the real growth opportunities in recent years, I mean, we all saw big tech explode in their investment in New York City and yeah. the leasing of space, 4 million square feet alone taken by big tech um, during COVID. Now, there's a little bit of a reset going on right now. Um, again, we, we don't have our heads in the sand. Everybody reads the headlines about um, some of the layoffs happening at big tech companies. Um, those numbers so far don't outweigh, outweigh the incredible um, job gain um, that happened during COVID. Um, so obviously we're monitoring that situation more to come. We're actually now putting out a monthly report on, on the economy. Um, there are a lot of different data points that come at people in the city, um, whether through DOL or the feds, uh, or OMB, we, or the controllers, we want to have our own, um, viewpoint about what we see happening in the marketplace. So if 
If you're not signed on to that monthly newsletter, um, I, I encourage you to do so. In terms of the other growth sectors, Travis, I mean, I really did hit on them. I mean, every, in some ways you have to follow the venture capital. And right. last year was the biggest venture capital year in, in New York City's history. Um, we are down significantly this year, but we're still 30% up from where we were in 2019. Um, so it is not as good a year as last year, but it is still a pretty solid year for New York. And, and far outpacing other regions of the country in terms of venture capital. And, and really at the top of that list is green tech, clean tech. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of that investment is being made across the globe. A lot of it emanates out of venture capital in New York City. We're trying to make sure that as much investment uh, stays in New York as possible. Um, cyber just exploding. Five years ago, EDC did great work before my time. Um, really focusing on the cybersecurity sector and how we could drive it through incubators and accelerators. Yeah. By the time I got here, we were already pivoting away from that because the reality is the industry is here. It's exploding. Our right. biggest challenge in cyber tech is workforce and creating pathways um, to folks uh, into those industries. So we have a number, a number of programs going on at Full Stack, a, a great training academy, as well as CUNY. Uh, we're going to be rolling out more programs around cyber uh, when we open up uh, Civic Hall Fed Cap in the new Zero Irving building that'll be opening later this year in Union Square. That'll really be, mm -hmm. I think, a model for the great city project, yeah. um, and the country. Um, life sciences, explosive growth. We now, as a metro area, have more life sciences than the Bay Area or the Boston area. That's pretty astonishing. Now, when you yeah. just look at New York City, five boroughs compared to Boston or San Francisco, we're still number three, but we're growing really fast and on track to create what we think will be 10 million square feet of new biotech space um, in the coming years. And a big part of that um, is the Spark Project, which I'd be happy to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear about the spot. I mean, so sure. that, that's a that's a really excited, yeah, exciting project. And 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 for those listening, you know, these are the types of ideas that are really being uh, considered these days um, by EDC in the city, and 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 some real good thinking and entrepreneurship around that ought to be considered. But yeah, that, please, I mean, that that was I saw that announcement; it was great. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, this really drew a line in the sand about how we want to um, operate at EDC, how the mayor want, views economic development. Um, it's holistic. Uh, in many cases, it involves partnership with the state. And so for those of us, you know, there are many on the call and certainly Travis who have seen the dysfunction between the city and the state. It's an incredible. <laughs> Still have PTSD that over that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we saw a site in the five acre Brookdale site, which um, houses uh, Hunter School of Nursing that was really a facility that had been falling apart and needed to be replaced for a long time. And we said, you know, five acres, there's a lot we can do here. Um, let's figure out a way to focus on life sciences and public health, mm -hmm. bring in CUNY, bring in DOE, bring in city agencies and public health and bring in the private sector and create an ecosystem on that one block um, in terms of career pathway, uh, product development, entrepreneurial uh, opportunity. And so on that space, we're gonna have three CUNY schools, a two-year school, BMCC focused on public health careers, uh, a four-year Hunter, a brand new school uh, for a fantastic school. Um, the uh, graduate school in public health is gonna be moving there for CUNY. So three CUNY schools at each level, two city agencies, the Department of Health, um, and uh, org is going to be there, unfortunately for all of us, <laughs> lots of jobs there, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and innovation happening, um, and then a, a private sector pad of 60,000 square feet where we'll put out an RFP and we believe get 750,000 square feet of private biotech space with all of those companies um, having baked into their leases relationships with the CUNY and, and DOE elements so that those students really get access. And then in the broader area around Spark, we have phase three mm -hmm. of the Alexandria project breaking ground uh, in the coming year, as well as 455 First Avenue, which is sort of catty corner. So if you look at all the sites combined, um, two and a half million square feet of bio biotech space going up just in the next few years. 
Well, it's amazing, Andrew, and, and I just want to say again, congratulations. I mean, I, when I when I saw the data announcement, when that announcement came out, I was like, this is an Andrew Kimball special. This is everything you dreamed about. It's the connection between growing industry and workforce development and local hiring and and just being really thoughtful and mindful of the future and creating this extraordinary experience. So, so congratulations on that. Um, last month, touch on this again. Last month, like you said the governor and the mayor are working together. Terrific. Uh, issued a report called uh, on the new New York uh, plan, which is this future economic vision thinking about, you know, which I thought was could have been even announced before COVID, but I think really takes into consideration what we've learned from COVID and moving New York City forward. And I was wondering if you could just walk us through you know, some of the highlights on that um, and kind of some of the expectations and, you know, where you guys see success and maybe even just touch a little bit on you know, is for folks in our audience who own businesses, like how do you know how do we fit in? How 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 could we be helpful um, in making sure that 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 very impressive you know vision it becomes realized? Yeah, um, you know, obviously this started because a real concern with our core um, business districts, particularly Midtown and Downtown, where forty five percent of all the new jobs in New York City are. 45%. So think about that from um, a tax revenue point of view. Um, and the fact that, you know, um, during COVID, now post-COVID, however you describe it, um, there's been a paradigm shift. And yeah. the notion of everybody being back in the office five days a week uh, is somewhat quaint at this point. So we've had to adjust. Other cities around the world have had to adjust. I think the days of having a uh, commercial downtown, just commercial only, are really over. This is a pivot happening in a lot of places. Um, so as you noted, some of this was happening pre-COVID, um, where you know you saw real trouble in leasing in the lower tier uh, of leasable spaces. So B and C space, if you will. Um, and then real success, which has continued, by the way, right through COVID and continues now in, you know, class A and trophy buildings. So buildings like one Vanderbilt, Hudson Yards, uh, some of the newer uh, adaptive reuse in the Penn Station area, mm -hmm. really, really doing well. Um, so some of this was coming down the pike anyway. We see a real opportunity to convert, call it in the 20 million square foot range. It's a relatively small amount when you think about 300 million square feet of commercial space um, in Manhattan, um, but converting 20 million or so, maybe 30 million, roughly 10% um, to housing. Um, mm -hmm. Combining that with some significant public realm improvements, and some of those were talked about um, in the plan, improvements around Grand Central, improvements on Fifth Avenue, Broadway, taking that to the next level, Hudson Square, Madison Square, you know, wider sidewalks, more green space, um, which we think will lead to some of that live work environment and a more dynamic um, interface at the floor plane of these buildings with some of traditional retail going away and the opportunity to have more um, interactive uh, experiences, um, could be culture, could be entertainment, could be making with retail. Some of the same mm -hmm. stuff we did at Industry City um, yeah. is now playing out in Rockefeller Center where Tishman Spire has been visionary about um, renovating uh, some of the retail around their buildings and really drawing people back in for a more um, interesting experience. Um, but we also realized in this process that um, one, we can't do it by ourselves. We have to have the state legislature and the city council on board because right. a lot of these involve regulatory changes. And so that's absolutely critical and will play out over the next six months. But you can't just look at Manhattan. There's incredible dynamism happening in the boroughs and also challenges. So a lot of that small business creation that I talked about along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront, how do we drive that, um, invest in it further? How do we take emerging commercial hubs like Broadway Junction or Jamaica um, or Morris Park in the Bronx mm -hmm. and, and really drive development in those areas. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about Broadway Junction and, and Jamaica um, and, and Morris Park from the mayor and others uh, in the coming months. 
uh, in terms of incentivizing the private sector, uh, investing in the public realm, making use of the strong mass transit opportunities in each of those locations, um, driving one of the programs we already have in place um, and is having an impact in Broadway Junction called the, the CARES program, um, city agencies revitalizing our economy. Um, and well done. Basically, yeah, that, that's a tongue twister. Um, <laughs> So the basic notion is, and you saw this decades ago with Metrotech, but you take a um, a city agency that doesn't need to be in Lower Manhattan or Midtown or in downtown Brooklyn or Long Island City, and you relocate them as an anchor tenant in a private commercial development mm -hmm. where the private sector developer also builds out double the amount of space. So that community gets half a building. And in the case of East New York, we have a building going up right now that'll um, results in 75,000 square feet of um, city agency and 75,000 square feet that could be small business leasing in the neighborhood. So on top of that, um, working very closely with the state again on the notion of a lower cost one seat ride on LIR or Metro North um, to get commuters into the central core or out of it. Um, and also, you know, how we do more cross borough transportation. I think the, the governor's leadership around the IBX is really visionary and um, super excited to see that play out. And EDC is going to be uh, a partner in that growth. That's great. Yeah, the inner borough is a fantastic project. It's just the just how it connects all those communities and neighborhoods, yeah. subway lines. That's a real game changer, a real game changer. Um, you touched on a little bit uh on the on on the movement of the commercial sector sort of out of manhattan and into the can you just sort of, and, and would love to just hear a little bit if you go a little deeper around and you talked about broadway junction jamaica morris park do, do you see those as being you know the new commercial centers as we look kind of 10 years down the road yeah, I don't think it's zero sum. I mean, I don't think yeah. town and downtown's loss is, is those commercial hubs gains. I think we need to build on what started to happen naturally um, right. during COVID, which was, you know, people wanted to either work from home or work closer to home so that mm -hmm. they could take a, a walk or a bike ride. Um, it's something that we always um, wanted to see more of in New York. You go way back to the Bloomberg administration with Plan NYC, you know, the big concern was we're going to get to 9 million people in the city and the subway system can't handle the right. density. So we need to do, you know, the exact same thing. Well, some of that has happened naturally from COVID. Sure. Um, so we really have to seize on, on the opportunity. I think there's a huge equity piece to this and building an inclusive economy um, where, you know, we see um, so many folks of color in New York City having much longer commute times. Um, to get to the central core, they ought to be able to access good paying jobs um, that are short commutes or, or walk from home. So all of that is a part of, of the strategy. Um, I would say what's going to help that outer ring of commercial growth um, is more housing density in those mm -hmm. areas. So I'm, I'm you know, super proud that I think we've gotten EDC and the team has been amazing, like back on track with a real job creation vision um, and we're starting to implement. Yeah. But the main crisis in the city right now in a lot of ways is, is housing and housing of all kinds. And so, you know, you've heard the mayor talk about it, you've heard the governor talk about it, you hear the mayor talk more about it later this week. Um, we need big, bold changing changes in, in density. Um, again, with access to opportunity for housing at all income levels. Um, and one of the really important things to the commercial growth in those outer hubs, Morris Park, Jamaica, Broadway Junction, just to pick three that are sort of on the perimeter of those boroughs, is the ability to have more transit-oriented development right outside the five boroughs. So mm -hmm. on this Metro North and LIRR stops in Westchester and Long Island. And the governor has you know, really laid out an important vision there. Uh, there has been tremendous local opposition to density uh, in the suburbs and candidly, and the, the governor said as much, you know, California, Illinois, New Jersey um, are outpacing New York now in, yeah. in smart growth uh, in that area. And so we've got to play a little bit of catch up. Yep. 
No, I totally agree. And just putting my regional plan association hat on, like so much of this has to be thought of, especially on the housing side, as a regional challenge as much as just a city challenge because of the space requirements. Yeah. Um, see, one other thing about yeah. New York that was really interesting is, yeah. um, and you wouldn't necessarily think EDC as a daycare thought center, but we have a tremendous team here that's been researching this and the linkages yeah. to economic opportunity, the billions of dollars of lost economic impact because we don't have um, strong daycare infrastructure. So again, both the mayor and the governor have taken big steps forward here, but we also need the private sector to engage. Um, it's very much a carrot strategy, not a stick strategy, but emphasizing sure. the benefits of having on-site daycare. And we're try trying to um, incentivize that uh, through our IDA uh, program um, for office conversions, for life sciences. Um, and, you know, what was interesting about the new New York panel is you had business leaders from all sectors, you had civic leaders, educational leaders, and daycare was right up there at the top of the list, along yeah. with, Makes you sense. know, commercial to residential conversion, public realm, transport. Um, and that's exciting for New York. And hopefully you're going to see some real innovation. There's a lot of venture capital money flowing into childcare tech right now, fam yeah. tech, sort of the sector. Huh. Uh, so really, really interesting. That's a new term. I hadn't heard fam tech. Fam tech, yeah. That's good. I mean, that's good to hear. I mean, and kudos, you know, you and Deputy Mayor, and Deputy Mayor Tori Springer and the mayor for, for really thinking about what are the obstacles preventing people from being able to actually be in these jobs that are going to be created and trying to attack that early on. I mean, whether it's childcare or I mentioned earlier, like the dyslexia stuff, um, transportation mobility. I mean, that's 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 real credit to you. So thinking about ways in which companies could engage um, and the private sector could play a role, what are some of the, you know, we have a bunch of business owners in the audience, I'm sure. What are some of the, can you talk a little bit about like some of the programs and ways in which people could approach EDC and work with EDC, try to be helpful in, in, in realizing this vision? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk uh, on the sort of programmatic side and then on the project side. So on the programmatic side, you know, first thing is for people to know is we have a whole business development group here. Yep. So you want to grow your company, you want to expand, you want to understand how to invest in your building. Um, they're our front door. Anybody can always reach out to me, um, but we have this trem tremendous um, business development group. We have tax incentive tools. Um, so the IDA um, that for commercial industrial buildouts of certain types um, certainly manufacturing, but also, you know, biotech that falls yeah. sort of in the gray area of part manufacturing, part commercial. Um, and so we're investing a very, very big amount uh, in biotech right now. Um, and, you know, we have the opportunity to think creatively with um, life sciences companies about, uh, about how to expand. One of the things I didn't mention at the beginning is that um, we have... Uh, 66 million square feet of space that EDC controls. Um, that's how we're funded. Uh, we're, we're not a city agency. We don't take tax levy. Um, so the revenue off of those assets fund the 550 people that work here. It also gives us tremendous opportunity to work with businesses looking to grow, um, yeah. particularly in the, in the sectors um, that we've targeted. Um, some of the other ways uh, are workforce development. Um, so, you know, cyber companies looking to grow, tap into workforce opportunities. We can create those marriages with some of the better workforce development providers to help them um, in that area. Um, just quickly running around the boroughs, and, I, and this goes more to the projects and how companies might plug in or learn about opportunities. You know, you've got obviously the Spark Campus on the Lower East Side. That's a huge piece of what we're doing in Manhattan. You go up to the Bronx, you've got lots of housing um, that we've helped facilitate in the Bronx Hub. You've got um, you've got Hunts Point Food Distribution Center. Um, Twenty five percent of everything we eat in New York comes through there. Um, it's a real sustainability um, and health issue. Uh, it's a decrepit facility um, that has a thousand trucks idling every day on fossil fuels. We're in the process of designing a three quarters of a billion dollar uh, redevelopment there just for the food produce center. That's not the fish market or any of the other individual businesses that are there. Key project for us. 
Um, you go a little farther north, um, the Kingsbridge Armory we're making another run at. Um, so there have been a couple of um, swings and misses over the last 20 years with the Kingsbridge Armory. Uh, this is an incredible, incredible facility, spectacular armory, uh, 200,000 square foot um, drill hall with 100 foot high ceilings, column free. Um, community is very interested in high job generating business uh, opportunities with linkages to career pathway and small business locally, um, and also potentially some recreation on site. There's six floors beneath uh, the drill hall at Kingsbridge Armory. You go farther north, you're at Morris Park, one of four new stops on the Metro North line. So the Bronx in general, I think, is so teed up to grow just with that transportation expansion and in particular yeah. around Morris Park with Montefiore, uh, Jacoby, um, and the life science is already there, Albert Einstein. There's an opportunity through an upzoning for a lot more commercial, hopefully a lot of it biotech and mm -hmm. residential. In Queens, um, we had a big win um, with moving the ball forward on Willits Point. Um, so yeah. Willits Point, about 70 acres, which, um, you know, was became famous um, in the Gatsby's Valley of Ashes, which was basically a, a burn pile of garbage for the city for yeah. over 50 years, the first part of the 1900s. And then the second part of the 1900s, it became a, a dystopian array of, of further polluting um, you know, car repair shops and chop shops. Um, over 20 years, the city's been reacquiring it, beginning a cleanup. And then thanks to Mayor Adams' leadership, we took a massive step forward, just recently announcing that uh, on the first phase of that project, we're going to create 2,500 units of 100% affordable housing, the largest yeah. affordable housing project in 40 years in New York City, and combine it with a brand new soccer only stadium. Travis and I are both big soccer <laughs> fans. It has much oh, I'll be, I'll be there, believe me. Than our own kids. It's a hop skipping um, away from where I live. So it's, uh, I can't wait. And, 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 and really the mic drop on that project is that unlike, almost any project we could find anywhere that was a professional sports stadium. This is 100% privately financed, $750 million by NYCFC for a 25,000 seat stadium. We'll also fit in with a really interesting sports cluster there now with the USTA and City Field where the Mets play um, and, and, um, and the new NYCFC stadium. I mentioned Jamaica, Long Island City, um, there's been real progress in development. Um, there have also been some near misses there. Um, we think there's just tremendous opportunity in Long Island City. So more to come. We're going to be working very closely with the community in the months ahead to kind of figure out what that future um, should look like. Um, in Brooklyn, I mentioned Broadway Junction. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of development that's coming down the pike. Um, in and around Brooklyn Hospital and LIU. We think there's some opportunity with some publicly owned sites there uh, to build on the growth, expand the growth, particularly the commercial area um, for downtown Brooklyn. And then along the Brooklyn waterfront, where I spent the last 20 years of my career, um, <laughs> there right. you know, we have 6 million square feet of space we control in buildings. And then there's also the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal that's going to become the nation's largest port servicing hub with a thousand jobs servicing offshore wind out in Staten Island, big focus on the North shore. We're in the process of a billion dollars of public infrastructure improvements there to create a green esplanade running all the way south, all the way north from Tompkinsville Stapleton around the tip of the North shore. Um, so you can ride a bike, you can walk, you can have recreation of various different kinds along the way. Um, we have a couple of projects that we're going to be hitting the reset button on, like the New York Wheel. Um, there's a really spectacular Actually. retail center there um, that needs a little work that we're on top of. So we see real opportunity in Staten Island. And then phase two in our efforts in offshore wind, we hope, knock on something, is going to be a very large scale manufacturing facility uh, servicing that sector. Could be wind turbines, could be the poles that go in the water 150 feet or the nacelles, which are the engines that turn those turbines. So wow. we're, we're optimistic. And I think for people in the private sector here, just come and talk to us. We yeah. want to partner with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's incredibly exciting. And, and I assume you have space in some of the buildings you own in case folks are looking for 
we for, do. for new space. That's good. And we're building more. <laughs> and by the way, I should also just just mention how excited among all those projects I am about the Queensway and that that EDC is taking that on to develop too because Central Queens got extraordinary potential. Look and and really thrilled that the mayor is um, committed and to that. Green, greenways are, I think, one of not only quality of life, and you know, you yeah. you wonder why why do the young people keep coming to New York? It is it's the diversity of the city, the culture, the racial diversity, and it's the quality of life, and so much of that is the parks and the Greenway and. People, I think, have rediscovered bikes more than ever. I, there was some great stat during COVID that, you know, every six cent, cent, seconds, six seconds, a new bike was being bought in New York City <laughs> for a number of months. That sounds about right. So, yeah. you know, we've got to expand that network uh, across the city. Queensway is an amazing project. Thank you. Yeah, I when I went during COVID to buy my son a bike, walk in the store and they laughed at me because they were completely sold out. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you talk about priority projects. Can we spend a second on workforce development? Because what I think has been fascinating about, about this administration in particular is you combined economic development and workforce development in such a special way, and, and including, by the way, naming the deputy mayor, deputy mayor for economic development and workforce development. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about planting businesses, it's about making sure that there's that New Yorkers are getting first access to that job. So can you just talk a little bit about EDC's role in that and kind of how you're envisioning yeah. The workforce development side of all this? Well, first of all, it's a great team. And as you say, um, there's nobody more experienced in government and economic development or workforce development than Maria Torres Springer. So yeah. we're really blessed to work with her. And, you know, she is a glue within City Hall to help us get stuff done across agency and also with the second floor in Albany. Um, so a key part of that, um, you know, at her disposal in terms of tools, the, the primary workforce development entity in the city is, is SBS. Um, mm -hmm. and Kevin Kim's doing a great job there. The mayor and he just rolled out, as you said, a $75 million loan fund focused on diverse BIPOC entrepreneurs. Um, we, and I mentioned some of this earlier, in each one of our key sectors have a number of different pathways to lead towards workforce development and entrepreneurship opportunities. And I, I combine them because you know, it's not always that you find somebody who's unemployed and you help them start a business and they're off. It's often that you find somebody who's unemployed or coming out of school, you help them find a job in a growth sector, and then they peel off and become an entrepreneur. So these two things are very closely linked. Um, you know, again, we think CUNY is absolutely critical to this. I would take it one step down further and, and DOE. Um, is a partner, needs to be an even bigger partner. The chancellor has really been visionary in terms of his plans. Um, you have projects out there like the STEAM Center at the Navy Yard, which mm -hmm. in five key growth sectors, pulls students from six public high schools and really leverages them up in terms of a vocational experience, working with Navy Yard businesses and others. We think we can do something similar to that. Um, at the Spark campus, and we hope we can replicate it in other locations. And then it's really being um, targeted in how we partner with workforce development organizations. So, and, you know, New York has some really, really good ones. Um, Full Stack is one we've had a lot of success with um, in cybersecurity uh, and coding. Um, uh, LaGuardia, I was just visiting yesterday, LaGuardia oh, Community LaGuardia. College on the CUNY front, you know, runs great workforce um, development. Again, part of doing well here, I think, means being fully coordinated um, and yeah. helping Maria in, in City Hall is Abby Jo Siegel, um, who uh, is really kind of pulling together all the pieces uh, across agencies to, to drive the workforce development op uh, opportunity. I think, you know, look, unemployment is coming back down, um, but it is still way higher than it should be um, in New York City. And the numbers for um, our Black and Latino brothers and sisters in the city, it is significantly higher than other populations. And we need to do more to address that. And I think, you know, creating, as the mayor likes to talk about, more and more upstream opportunities, vocational opportunities at a young age. Other countries around the world have outpaced us in this, you know, Germany, Switzerland, sure. vocational programs that are that are much deeper early on without 
taking away from the liberal arts that I think it's really important for all students to get. Yeah. And there's such diversity in sort of imagination too, because you have such a great Im immigrant population here that you're seeing ideas and thoughts and, and energy that come from all parts of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I live in Central Queens, and it's just extraordinary the the, the level of business acumen that uh, helps. So if if somebody is is accessing talent and needs talent, they should come to EDC. They should come to the city and really have a have a conversation around. And you'll direct them about where to how to use city resources to access talent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, that's a okay. that's a big role that we can play. Um, you know. Businesses in any sector can come to us, you know, I've, as I've explained before, like we're really focused on those growth sectors. But if somebody from, you know, retail comes to us, we're probably going to send them more to SBS uh, yeah. to support their needs. Um, but uh, no, that that is something this administration is very, very focused on. Good, good, good. So I'm starting to get oh, there's a whole bunch of questions in the in the Q&A and I'm start to some. There's a, there's a number of themes that I'll just ask for you, but can you talk a little bit, you, you mentioned before the conversion of one of the big questions, a couple of questions around the conversion of of commercial to residential. Can you talk about the spe maybe the specific actions that need to occur in order to, to make that happen over the next year or so? And, and then, you know, particularly, I know you mentioned a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. is legislatively based. Uh, and, and are there things we could all be doing to sort of help push, you know, some of those uh, advocacy goals forward to make it happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so um, on the conversions, first is building typology. They tend to be, you know, smaller footprint buildings um, pre-2000 or pre-1990 builds. And again, we're most likely to be underperforming before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the key examples. In order to convert to residential, that requires regulatory change at the state legislative level and at the city council level. Um, if there's going to be an affordability component to that, and mixed use is something that, you know, I certainly believe we should strive for in, in every project. Um, but that's going to require a new um, state legislative program. Um, there has to be a new 421A um, yeah. in order for the broader um, housing goals to be met. Um, there uh, is a cap on high, how, how high you can go with buildings. So if you were to take down a building and build a new residential tower, there's a cap on that. It's called the 12 FAR cap. That needs to be lifted. We need to have more um, density in Midtown. Um, so those are a few on the regulatory side in terms of what you can do. Yes, yes, and yes. Please reach out yeah. to your local elected officials um, and, and talk to this need for more density and housing of all kinds. Mm -hmm. you know, there's always the discussion and, and often people just say, we should only be building affordable housing. Well, part of the way you get more affordable housing is by building more market rate housing. So the folks who can afford market rate housing don't keep pushing across the city and taking space that might otherwise be more affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need it of all kinds. Um, you know, this is my first go around with the state legislature. I think there are a lot of members of goodwill. I am hopeful we can make progress there. I think at the city council level, there's a growing recognition um, of the need for more density in every district um, across the city. Um, I give the prior administration real credit for, you know, pointing out that we need housing of all kinds, even in a place like Soho, right? It can't just yeah. be that we're building all the housing, particularly affordable housing in lower income districts. Um, so, yeah. Is that uh, what else on on housing and conversions? Yeah, put Those put our, put us to work. Let us uh, let us help you sort of make some of that happen because Good. housing is, it, you know, when 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 we have conversations even at the firm with companies overseas, and they talk about attracting talent to their companies if they were to enter the New York market, part mm -hmm. of their concern is 
are there employees, do, will employees be able to afford living here? Yeah. So that becomes a barrier to entry uh, in some ways. And um, so, you know, kudos to you and in, in, to the city and to the state for really making that a high priority because that's the crux of it. Um, Andrew, there's a bunch of questions too around just resiliency um, yeah. and in everything from addressing local law 97 to climate tech to just resiliency uh, investments. And you touch a little bit on that, but I was wondering if you maybe extrapolate a little bit on some of the EDCs and the city's goals around resiliency and, and projects and, and focus. Yeah, um, I mean, if we don't move faster, we're gonna have some real issues coming down the pike on, on resiliency um, in terms of climate change and sea level rise. Um, there is a lot of work going on right now. Um, you see the construction along the FDR, um, on the East Coast resiliency, East Side resiliency project, excuse me, and that's that's managed by the city's DDC. Everything south of the Brooklyn Bridge, all the way around the tip of Lower Manhattan, is EDC. Mm -hmm. And so, there is some money in place um, for planning and design now. Um, and one of the most exciting projects is in the in the FIDI um, area. So, sort of think Seaport, you know down um, to the Battery Maritime Building. Um, it is very hard to do resiliency on the shoreline because you cannot go very deep because there are 14 subway lines um, right below the surface. So we're looking at a design plan now that will basically create uh, marsh plans and a series of um, storm barriers um, and, you know, basically um, high tide blockers in some ways, because at the high tide mark now um, there's flooding in par some parts of the city. So um, basically another five to 10 acres of marshland and park to be created with walkways going through it. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably in the $10 billion range to execute. We are in um, early design, we expect to get to 30% design um, by the end of next year and have a real number that we can then go out and hopefully tap into some of the federal infrastructure dollars, um, the, the state bond act monies. Uh, but we also need to think creatively uh, and of other ways to finance the project through the private sector, um, potentially with value capture or leverage mm -hmm. on insurance savings. So we're looking at mm in all of okay. the above. Um, but I've just mentioned two projects in Manhattan, one of the wealthiest places to live in New York City. There's obviously, there are 550 miles of shoreline um, in the city. Um, EDC, by the way, controls about 200 miles of that. Um, but there's a massive challenge in communities across the city. And there are some smaller projects um, underway. We have a number in the Jamaica Bay area. Um, but it's nowhere near enough. So uh, there's going to be an updated plan NYC coming out in April around Earth Day. And you're going to hear a lot more about um, the city's resiliency strategy there. Part of resiliency also, though, is energy, um, sustainability and resiliency and getting off of fossil fuels. And so that is a massive focus of ours, again, with offshore wind, with battery storage, with implementation of local law 97, with other kinds of prop tech investments that we're trying to pilot in our own buildings today. Now, oh. and do you think the federal infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act will be is, is kind of a catalyst to help support some of those efforts? There is more money, Travis, um, in our lifetimes sloshing around at the federal level, the <laughs> CHIPS Act, IRA and infrastructure, it's an extraordinary yeah. moment and we can't miss that moment. So we have a great, great team, grants team at EDC. I'm now meeting with them on a very regular basis to make sure that we are staying ahead of the curve. There is a whole um, grants team in City Hall to coordinate and make sure the different agencies aren't stepping on each other. Um, but as one example, we just won $110 million uh, grant for the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center from federal DOT. That's the largest federal grant EDC has ever received. Um, and we hope that um, there'll be numerous other ones coming down the pike in the next few years, but there's a lot of competition across the country for that money. 
And I would imagine that that the investment in resiliency is also, you know, when you look at the future of economic development, the resilient the cities that have actually, well, first of all, believe that resiliency is important, uh, as compared to some of our other cities uh, around the country, but that have made those proper investments are going to thrive as we continue to see climate change and and all the effects that come from that. Hundred percent. Hundred um, percent. Yep. And so, you know, when I think with my team about the innovation sectors that I laid out, yeah. um, and you just look at the venture investment happening, you know, green tech, clean tech is exceeding every other sector: right. cyber, AI, robotics, advanced manufacturing, film and television. It's amazing. Um, there's an interesting. We only have a few more minutes, but there was an interesting question about congestion pricing. I was wondering if you could. Comment yeah. a little bit about your thinking thinking around that and how that's going. Yeah, I mean, uh, another key part of resiliency in the broadest sense, sustainability. Um, you know, how do we fund our mass transit properly? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we reduce congestion in central business districts? Um, it also, and so I'm a big believer, but there's, you know, much to be implemented um, and rules and regulations to be set around it. Um, so, you know, where I sympathize is, and, and we need to be figuring out solutions is, you know, for uh, reducing truck traffic sort of in the bands of highways um, that run across uh, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. And, you know, that's going to create a ripple effect of other problems. Um, both from pollution, traffic, and and the economy, um, if we're not smart about it. So, um, you know, when I talk to companies at Hunts Point, um, food distribution companies, you know, that have to make 10, 20 truck runs to deliver to restaurants or to markets um, in Manhattan below 60th Street every day, yeah. and they're looking at a, you know, $20 a trip charge, like those numbers are adding up very, very fast. So we need to figure out ways to move goods more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And a big part of that, I'll go back to what I mentioned at the beginning, is moving goods um, by barge. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of European mm-hmm. cities are way ahead of us. Um, we need to get on it. And, and we are on it, working with the Port Authority and New York State and New York City DOT um, to really roll out uh, a system that makes sense, um, and particularly around micro mobility. Um, you know, yeah. goods are now getting delivered in big containers. They can be broken down into much smaller units that can go onto the back of a electric bike um, or new electric vehicles that are very small and can maneuver the streets of Manhattan and and other core commercial hubs around the city. Um, so that that that's something we're working very hard on right now in terms of where the freight comes in, how it gets delivered, the bike lanes um, for each building, where it goes into, and again, working very collaboratively with other city agencies like DOT. Great, great, great. Well, Andrew, I mean, I have yes, you know, I think fifteen other questions that if we could we could sort of sit here all day and, and answer, um, and some some de- some good comments, including. Oh, one good one, which is the importance of considering healthcare and all sorts of in all planning and economic development, investment, and things of that nature to make sure that that delivery structure is is connected. But I just want to, um, oh God, I could do this all day. But um, uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Um, I, I know I learned a lot. I mean, just just hearing you know the entrepreneurial efforts since COVID that one in nine businesses have, that entrepreneurial efforts have started since COVID. The um, Focus on some of these neighborhoods outside of Manhattan, like Broadway Junction, Jamaica Morris Park. So you know, you really and, and just your the, the conversations around projects in Staten Island and, and the Bronx. And I mean, just a real five borough vision, and the ability to make the people that are living in each of those five boroughs' lives a little better and their economic opportunity and mobility a little better. So, um, you know, Andrew, you're 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 thinking around this. I'm so glad we have you there. I'm really excited to see what's uh, what's ahead. Um, all, every every time we talk, I learn a little bit more about about the way in which our city functions and the way in which our economy grows. Um, and, and really, kudos to you and the mayor and deputy mayor Tori Springer for all your leadership on this. I think the 
the, we're all a city residents and frankly, the region and maybe even the globe, Frank. I mean, just when you think about the pure scale importance of New York are in good hands. Um, and finally, just want to say, Andrew, you know, um, you know, I hope you'll you'll also know that that uh, we're here to help um, and anything we can do to make sure that that the city's successful, the ADC is successful, you know, you always we're just always a phone call away. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, everybody, for joining. All right, everyone. Take care.